lead into, and I'm trying not to jump ahead because there's so many things I want to get to. Go ahead. Just, just keep going. I'll see if I can remember as you bring it. <laughs> <laughs> because you, I, I, I like how you're walking us through this because now we're in the 60s. And it seems okay. as though in your life, you have watched things happen to mm -hmm. Black folks that impacted mm -hmm. you. So now let's go to you graduate out of high school. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your life. Give me some stories from that time period. Okay, high school. Uh, the mid to late sixties, right? Then you look at no, it's still the early sixties. I graduated. I graduated in nineteen sixty two. Okay, so now. Yeah. So now, now, do you think that the civil rights era. <laughs> who is Cobra mm -hmm. John? Okay, uh, that, was, that was actually kind of pre-civil rights era because. You heard mention they mentioned about the NAACP, and that'd be like mentioning Black Lives Matter right now. You know, they get old. Oh, don't say that around us, you know. But uh, I remember uh, we, we came up with the uh, school colors for our robes and caps and gowns and stuff like that. And and the black folks, you know, uh, you know, black we came from out of something township and uh, went to Belleville High School, and it's, we had a we had a pretty good contention up there, and uh, we kind of voted on. Uh, burgundy and gray, kind of like the Northwestern high school colors. But no, we want Kelly and white. And it was more than it was us, so that's what we got, Kelly and white. And so, you know, I like, I didn't even go to my uh, school prom. So I didn't even think about them folks. And uh, let's see. Okay, let me back up. Where are we going? Uh, you know, we had, that's when I started seeing things that you in high school and, hey, John, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. When I was in my little doo-wop group. And they invite us over to their house to sing and stuff like that. Downtown of Belleville, and, okay, parties and stuff. But when you see them individually on the street, like when my mother would, would come up to uh, uh, Belleville to wash clothes in downtown Belleville, I think the laundry mess might still be there. Hmm. And uh, we would help her wash clothes and stuff like that. And I saw one of my schoolmates and I called him out by his name. He turned his head real quick and wouldn't say nothing. I said, oh, okay, now I see, see where you're coming from. So that's how it is. But anyway, uh, I got out of high school and uh, went back to uh, back to the city and uh, started my life. Oh, well, not really, not really, because I got a job at, uh, I was trying to get a job as an uh, auto mechanic because I had graduated from uh, Wolverine School of Trades. Nobody would hire me. That thing was like, oh, you need experience. I said, uh -huh, okay. Okay, I'll keep going on that. And uh, I finally got a job at a gas station to work on cars. You know, the dude just had me pumping gas and checking oil. Back then, that's when they did that. But he came up to me uh, a couple of days later. He said, hey, I got my, my neighbor's kid here. Why don't you teach him what you know about mechanics? And that way, blah, 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 and blah. Because, you know, white folks didn't want me working on their cars. So, okay. Mm -hmm. I quit and left. <laughs> really? And got a job. Yeah, yeah. End up getting a job at Ipsy State Hospital, psychiatric attendant nurse. The pay was uh, uh, minimum wage back then was a dollar a quarter an hour, and you could actually live off a dollar and a quarter an hour back then. Uh, could get a pay paycheck twenty dollars a week. You fill up fill up your gas tank for about five bucks. In the state, my folks they had money to, you know, go places and do stuff and wasn't nothing open. But uh, excuse me. Only place open 24 hours was brand new was White Castle. <laughs> that was brand new back in the day. Nothing, else, everything closed. Yeah, like I said, wasn't no, wasn't no theaters open on Sunday. And uh, matter of fact, you consider the center if you even thought about going to going to move going to show on Sunday. And then right. the shows didn't even open until uh, at mid uh, mid. What do you call them? Uh, what do you call them things? Uh, uh, mid not midday thing, but you know, uh, over late in the afternoon. Mid matinee, yeah. And uh, you definitely go at night because you have your butt back at home. You had to go to school. But if we went to the went to the theater, we went with all all the neighborhood neighborhood kids went at one time. You know, mm -hmm. pay what is a nickel or five, you know, something like that to get in the show. It wasn't that much. But uh, where was I? Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, got that. I got a job as a psychiatric nurse at the Interstate State Hospital, and that's when I started getting growing up and stuff like that, start seeing different things, meeting folks that, that weren't Christians. And so, okay, and got, got with a couple of the brothers from 
Detroit. They, they would come from Detroit to work out there and they had me hanging with them. And I was a young blood. <laughs> and uh, anyway, from there, uh, uh, I messed around there and worked there uh, about a year and a half. And I got my, got my, uh, got my uh, Galaxy 500, 393 speed. Couldn't get a 427. So, but anyway, I got my draft notice. And, uh, uh, cause they're, you know, let's see, I was, cause they was talking about Vietnam when I was in high school, but they, they were just had little whispers of it. You didn't see that much of it. And, uh, guys was talking, oh, Vietnam. I said, what is that? I don't know anything done about it. That's y'all business. But I got my draft notice and, uh, I went in downtown Detroit on 4th Street for the physical and everything. Got through that. And they, they, they pulled me out the line and had me sit in the room. And I said, yeah, okay, I ain't think nothing about it because I don't know what this is. And they came in and told me, well, you can go back home. I said, okay, what, why, why is that? And so we, we'll let you know. And uh, I come figure, figured out was that they, because uh, I stayed on campus at Ipsy State Hospital. So they figured I was a mental patient trying to get, get in the military. <laughs> so I was laughing all the way back home. <laughs> I went back home, my folks were still crying. I said, like, what you doing back here? That's they told me to go home. And uh, I guess they figured out uh, 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 I lived it. I was an uh, inmate at Ipsy State Hospital. And wow. so we laughed about that and stuff. And a couple of weeks later, I got, got the second notice. And that's when I finally said, you don't have to go into the Army that time. You could pick the other branches. And so I picked the Air Force. I like the airplanes anyway. Boom. That's where, that's where that started. That's, now that's uh, 1965. So you, when they drafted you, so they didn't take you then. Did they reach mm -hmm. out to you again, or did you? Yeah. Oh, okay. So they called you back, and now they just said you can choose another branch to go into. Then no, that that, that was what it was. I found out that you you didn't have to go straight. You didn't have to be drafted into the army, but because army was like a uh, what uh, eighteen months, mm -hmm. and uh, but they say if you choose any other uh, navy. Marines or Air Force, you'd have to do four years. So I said, if I gotta do four, I sure ain't going to Marines. They they nuts. <laughs> and I don't like I don't like that much water, so I ain't going to the Navy. I said, I like airplanes. I'm joining I'm joining to the Air Force. Okay. And that's what I did. But like I said, when they re realized their error, that I didn't I wasn't an inmate at Ipsy State House, but I actually stayed on campus. It's oh, let's get this end back in here. You know, we need cannon fodder. So Man, that's when they got you. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah, got that's it. when they got me the second time. No, not this time. I'm going to Air Force. Spent four years, yep, uh, three and a half years. But anyway, that's what that's what that happened. But um, that was my first plane ride out to Texas. I don't like Texas. Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> we, we, the plane plane landed in Dallas. I didn't realize the time we had. To, you thought it'd be a short bus ride. We had to go to uh, San, uh, near San Antonio, Texas. It was on Southern Texas. And that was about an eight hour ride. We go to speed, wake up, we still on the road. Don't see nothing but wide open fields and jackrabbits. Oh, like, oh man. Now the kids say back later, are we there yet? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So but that was it. It was Texas. So you end up going into the Air Force right during the Vietnam War. How was that? No, it, it had any. It was it was just starting, you know, 1960, 65. Oh, so it was just it, yeah, it was just starting to crank up. Yeah, that was before they hit it big. So I was in the Air Force C-130 crew chief because they saw my uh, uh, history that I had uh, had a uh, de uh, certificate in all all the mechanics, mm. and uh, they needed mechanics more than need because I uh, I scored big in all all, uh, all the mechanics and. Uh, uh, the office thing and so uh they didn't need nobody working in the office so uh, yeah okay aircraft mechanic good so they they stuck me in the air, air, aircraft mechanic went to school for that and they put me on c-130s well let me ask this because with what you have seen in your life up until that point mm -hmm. how did you now feel going to fight for this country when you had had watched personally at the age of three or four the stark racial differences between how whites and blacks were getting treated and now mm -hmm. you're being called to 
basically defend this system. How, how did you view it in your mind and how did that end up impacting you? Well, when I first went in the Air Force, I didn't look at it as defending the system because I said, oh, I'm going to Air Force. I ain't, go to, I ain't gotta go to Vietnam, whatever they talking about. Because it still wasn't that hot in Vietnam yet. They had military folks going over there, but uh, not that big of numbers. It wasn't until 1966 that things started cranking up mm. in 67. And uh, like I'm in stationed at Lockbourne Air Force Base in, uh, right outside Columbus, Ohio. A couple other Detroit guys there in 1965, 66. And in 1967, that's when the riots broke out in Detroit. And they used my airplanes, the C-130s, to go to Fort Campbell, Kentucky and pick up guys in the 82nd the Airborne, the 101st, and fly them to Detroit uh, to stand by, you know, the, because the city was riding, but they wouldn't let the black guys from Detroit go. Because I was actually crew chief on the airplane. When your plane goes be out, go more than three days, you're supposed to be with it. But they wouldn't. They confined us to base. I'm saying, well, what is wrong with them? You know, because the white guys were like, hey man, bring back color TVs. So I ain't thinking nothing about it. You know, not not how serious it was. But oh. during that time, we didn't go. So okay, came on back and. They, they had me training on the, this guy. I remember his first name, Vinny. I'll forget his last name. I know I know he's Italian, but I was supposed to be training under him as a crew chief. And all he had me to do was try to take screws out of the floors of the airplanes and put them back. I said, they ain't teaching me no job. So I got upset, man, you ain't teaching me nothing. So I guess he talked to somebody and it, it some, them, them dudes from Detroit. I know I'm quite sure they called me something else, but uh, <laughs> uh, they put me took me out from under his care and just had me bouncing around. And uh, during that time, they tried to court martial me for, for different stuff. Some of the stuff I hadn't done, you know, some of the stuff I was doing, but they didn't catch me. And uh, so that's why I'm feeling, what is wrong with these folks? You know, and they, they hit me with an article 15 at about at least three different times. So I'm saying, you know, I went to them, went to the command and stuff like that and stated my case first two times, you know, didn't make no sense. You know, they couldn't really do nothing. They really ain't done. They got to do something better than this. I said, okay. So, now, now I'm reminding you, I'm, I got two stripes on my sleeve. Airman first class. Um, they put two guys on me, two white guys, to train them to be crew chiefs. Okay, I did that. By that time, I learned how to do stuff and prep the airplane and when to go out and when to come back and everything. How to look for stuff anyway how to work on the airplane. And they promoted them guys over me. Mm. No, I had one stripe. I'm talking, I had one stripe. And, they, and I'd been in service about two and a half years. And these guys come in, both of them, one of them for Canada. And uh, well, I, I go in another story about what they was doing, but they promoted them guys over me. They got two stripes. In other words, they was my boss. Since after I trained them, now they were my boss. So I just said, mm, I ain't doing nothing. Y'all can promote them over me, let them do the work. And somehow it must have made them mad. They're trying to come up with something else on Article 15 on me. And at, at that time, you know, I wrote to my parents, but they, how they was messing with me and whatever. Anyway, I ended up writing my freshman congressman about how they was doing me in, in the service. And, and about that time, they were starting to pick up uh, uh recruiting, drafting guys to go in the army to start this thing in Vietnam because it's, it's kicking up then. And anyway, this this freshman congressman, John Conyers, mm. he was looking for something to do because he said, hey, I'll give me something. He got all up in the backside. Oh, man, it was showing up hot then, but they couldn't do nothing because they I went straight to the congressman. They didn't have no power over that. Base commander couldn't even mess with him. So they fooled around there and fooled around. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, long story short, I met my oldest daughter's mother and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, ended up marrying her under adverse conditions. And uh, uh, it announced ahead of town. I got married in uniform and all that stuff in the father's church. And uh, five days, was it 10 days after we got married, Excuse me. They gave me, they cut me some orders to go overseas for eight, uh, 
excuse me, 13 months. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, they they upset because I brought the got brought the uh, congressman on them. So I'm not knowing what's going on still on. But uh she I knew it was racism. Yeah. Cause they're you know, back then the guys were scared to say some black guys were scared to say stuff back then. But I'm from Detroit, I ain't scared of. Well and, uh, so they go ahead. No, I was just gonna ask. That was quite brave of you to write the congressman, but that's something that I think I'll just say even today, most young yeah. people wouldn't think, oh, I'm going to write my congressman. What right. was it about you that <laughs> you were, I, I'm going, I used the term that they were probably even to say it then about you. Uh, what made it, what made you so uppity and militant that you going to write the congressman? Uh, I guess like you said, in, right in, the, in the Bible, it says in the blood, because my father and his folks didn't take no stuff off nobody. They weren't scared of them, and I wouldn't either. You know, I was kind of small and sickly for my size. But, yeah, I had a lot of fight in me. I was feisty. Didn't mind fighting them. Mm. Just I knew enough about the law not to punch nobody because I'd go to jail. But they, they couldn't punch me and call me out my name up front. So they just went behind the back and cut me some orders to go overseas for 18 months. 13, yeah, 13 months because they knew I just gotten married. And so that, that uh, let's see, I got married in September and uh, my orders to leave, leave out of Columbus, Ohio, but they gave you some days to uh, move your stuff out and get ready to go. So I went back to the, uh, my wife stayed in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio with her folks. And I went to Detroit and left Detroit and got on the bus, going to Greyhound, going to Chicago. And, uh, Jumped on the bird, it's 707, we called it 70 quickies back then. And uh, the plane took off, flying to the West Coast. And as we were flying over um, uh, Grand Canyon, uh, the pilot came over to announce and made an announcement, said all military personnel to stay in the terminal when you get to uh, uh, Los Angeles. So I was like, yeah, okay, what's up with that? But there were folks, now this is 19, uh, January 1968. So there were guys on the plane that come home from R and R. They knew what it was. They were saying, "Us oh, uh, Ted offensive." You know, the guys like me, look at them. What's a Ted offensive? The guys they had, had that stare, blank look in their face. I said, "Yeah, okay." So I just did that, and we dropped down in uh, L.A. and uh, I said, "Okay." You know, he said, "All health and skeleton." All the military military guys they stayed in the terminal. Because I guess it said if you went outside the terminal, you was gone. <laughs> mm -hmm. You was heading out to LA and they wasn't coming after you in LA. <laughs> Even back then. And uh, but anyway, uh, we jumped on the plane. I uh uh I'm trying to think where, where did that plane go? I knew we was in the air for quite a few hours flying over the Pacific Ocean. If you ever flew, you ever have any idea how big the Pacific Ocean is, fly from LA to Southeast Asia. You'd be up in the air eight hours, nothing water. It's yeah. uh, 500, 600 miles an hour, and you still over water. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we, yeah, and we touched down. One guy got a little panicky, talking about, oh man, what if we crash? This dude, if you crash over here, you dead anyway. <laughs> you want to get a chance to drown. <laughs> right, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he, he just calmed down after that. So, okay. Yeah, be on the airplane that long, a bunch of GIs. It was plain, nothing but GIs on the plane. That's what it was. That's how the airlines made their money, flying folks. Vietnam and back. But I touched down in uh, Clark Air Base in the Philippines and everybody's running around, you know, like somebody pulled a fire alarm and everybody running everywhere. And I'm like, I found a place where I was supposed to go. I said, hey, where is it? Hey, don't worry, we going. I ain't got time, you know. But I called this uh, one guy, stopped me. I said, hey, man, uh, what do I do? I'm going to Mactan, you know, which is an uh, island in the southern Philippines. And he said, yeah, that's, that's where I'm from. I said, oh, okay, what do I do? He said, man, they know you're here. Just relax. Yo, don't worry about it. And I ended up uh, sitting, sitting in Clark Air Base three days. And that, that same guy came back. He was shaking from head to toe. I mean, we talking serious shell shock. They was walking to him because he was his nerves were shot. But uh, that's when he heard that uh, uh, the, Viet, the Viet Cong and all them had overrun the uh, uh, Thompson New Air Base, which is Ho Chi Minh. And uh, they was all on the airline throwing satchel charges, blowing up airplanes and stuff like that. I'm like, oh man. 
send me over here. And I guess the guys back in Ohio to sent me that they're probably jumping up and down. Right. Uh, but uh, I didn't have time to worry about that. It was my life then. But anyway, I made it to the Mac 10 out of Clark Air, which is about 400 miles south of Clark Air Base. Uh, and I think, uh, what, Manila is about 80 miles north of the Clark Air Base. But Mac 10 was like uh, 400 miles south of uh, Clark. But Mac 10 was supposed to be a remote assignment. They called themselves Get Me. Uh, they gave me a remote assignment. Would it turn out to be a blessing? Because mm. when you send me to a remote assignment, I get $55 a month more for the remote assignment. Then once I'm there, I get $55 more dollars a month for being in the combat zone. Then once I, plus I was getting uh, $55 a month for flight pay. You know, you fly so many hours a, a month or, uh, you know, on a three month period, you had to uh, maintain your flight pay. So I was, I was making some good money back then. Nice. Just, yeah. But anyway, I got down to uh, Mac 10. And uh, got there, and uh, where did I stay? Where did I stay? And guy, man, we ain't got time for that. Just take take the barge across the bay and go find your motel. I didn't know what it was dark. I didn't know nothing. Went down to the barge. The barge went across. And what it was, uh, Mac Tan was a remote island. It's a little bit bigger than it's a little bit bigger than Belle Isle, mm -hmm. and I guess about thirty percent bigger than Belle Isle because they had a it was big enough to, for a, a mile mile long runway, and uh, Anyway, I, I got on that, got on that bars and went across to uh, to the uh, to the next island, which I found out later was the second largest island in the Philippines. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> this is cool. This is way cool. So uh, I look, I got me a room, yeah, and and somebody else. And uh, but anyway, <laughs> we spent the night there, and I got up the next morning because I had to make road call, and the bars would leave at six o'clock. Going back to the island because he had a lot of people would get on the bars and uh, come work on the island. You know, the Filipinos would come work on the island. And so I was on a bunch, got on the bars with a bunch of them. So I wasn't too bad, but I could feel that thing rolling up and down. And I found out later that, that we were actually in that sea. I mean, that sea was actually 150 feet deep. I was like, oh man, but the bars were so high, you couldn't see over the sides. So I just stayed there. It was, one, it was just a little short ride, but uh, I like, yeah, okay. But uh, we got there. And the uh, we I didn't have to make no bears or do nothing because they had the Filipino folks that did all that. They clean up the bears, bears your bears. Uh, they worked at the chow hall, and uh, so it was it was it was paradise, really. Yeah. We go downtown. We had uh, had a uh, village of people that stayed on Mactan, just outside the base. It was a nice little village. And we would go down and eat Philippine food and everything. They they loved to see us. We were spending money down there. Instead of eating at the, eating on the base, you know, because we could do that. But that was part of it. Like I said, I was there from, from January to March. Yeah, in, in March, I found, you know, I got assimilated to the heat and all that stuff. And that San Miguel beer gave you a headache the first three days. But after you get up the first three days, you can drink it all you want then. And they served the beer warm. So <laughs> mm -hmm. we, had to, we had to teach them how to serve ice cold beer. <laughs> right. But, uh, uh, our first trip to Vietnam was in March, and that's when uh, it was still hot. Mm. It was still hot because they were still doing stuff. And uh, I got the uh, uh, got the Tonsonute, and I had I was in charge of like three or four different C one thirties as they come in. And uh, I saw, as a matter of fact, I saw one tail numbers on one of these uh, History Channel things, but. Uh, I did my work so good. Another thing, another thing about racism. The uh, the base was hot, especially at nighttime. But they had a twenty uh, twelve hour curfew, like from six o'clock in the evening to six o'clock, six thirty in the evening, six six thirty in the morning. And uh, all the white guys jumped on the daytime shift. So by me being new, I was I was on nights, which was even better because there wasn't that many officers around. So that's <laughs> We can do our thing and like smoking weed and everything. So, but uh, but that's when they hit the base at nighttime, short lobbing rockets over in there and everything. And uh, I guess I worked good enough to where uh, the, my line sergeant, he was in charge of uh, line of C 130s, and he liked the way I worked. I messed around, I had two strikes, they messed around and gave me three. 
So that was unusual getting a, which was a sergeant back then, E4 under four. That was highly unusual, but I was in the combat zone, so I got a combat promotion. I guess them guys back in, back in Ohio, they, they jaws got locked up behind that was out. <laughs> Right. It was when I finally finally got out of so uh, once you get out, you're supposed to go back to your home base. And I had six months to go. So what you wanted, y'all gonna send me back to Lockbourne? I, like, I don't care. What they gonna do? Send me to Vietnam. I'm just leaving here now. Mm-hmm. And they cut me my order, told me, no, you get out, you going out all the way. Yeah, because I wasn't taking taking nothing off none of them suckers. I wasn't scared of them no more because I seen all kinds of stuff. Yeah, in the military, uh, in the Philippines and Vietnam, you had the white section and the black section. Uh, you would lead lead a base, uh, Clark base in the Philippines. Uh, you know when you're off off duty to go downtown, and right outside the gate was where the white guy stayed. You had to walk through the whole white section and cross the bridge to get where uh, where the black folks was welcome. And uh, we even heard stories about because the Philippines, you know, they Philippines. They tell you quick, their background is African. Mm. Their background is African. And because the Spanish came to the Philippines and made it with the Africans, and that's where the Filipinos come from. And the Puerto Ricans, too. Don't let them hide. It's them, too. But uh, they would tell us that white guys said, don't, don't, uh, we couldn't mess with you black guys. We did. We couldn't. They wouldn't be bothered with us no more. I told them, they ain't thinking about them. because They said, we like you guys better. Y'all party hard. <laughs> spend a little more money, too. <laughs> well, you spent, well, the white guys spent a whole lot of money. They, they, they paid twice as much as we did. So, that's all right.